as memorialized in Mr. Castor's press release that a decision was made by the DA's office not to prosecute this defendant. Uh, since we're the Supreme Court, this, this uh, case obviously has implications well beyond this defendant. Uh, what is the lesson that emerges from your position in this case regarding the reliability of prosecutorial decisions? Uh, what is the implication for the thousands of promises made by prosecutors across the Commonwealth uh, every day or every week? Uh, uh, plea deals, uh, immunity agreements, uh, non-pros agreements, uh, agreements to cooperate with witnesses, etc., in return for something, etc. Um, if if your office's word is not its bond, uh, and we validate your position here, what is the lesson that emerges uh, from beyond this case for all cases going forward in Pennsylvania? You understand my question? While the investigation team was still strategizing on the next steps, and that's from uh, Detective Richard Schaefer's testimony at trial. He said when he got the call that the case was closed, he and his team were still mapping out the next steps in the investigation. So that's a call. That's a call. Just one, just one brief follow up. Can I just have one brief follow up on my question? A sitting DA made a decision memorialized in a press release. You, you don't like that. Uh, you being the successor's office, that is. Um, but why does that not bind you as the successor office? If we're just talking about the, the strictly the press release, nobody should reasonably rely upon that for transactional immunity. That would be a horrible precedent to set. That defendant can take that press release and say, I am forever immune. And then a court is later going to uh, enforce that. That is not that is not fair. That is not fair to the Commonwealth. And it's unreasonable for defendants to expect that. If they are, yes. Yeah. Sorry, it's Justice Todd. Um, isn't it fair also to look at Mr. Cosby's re reasonable reliance on the agreement he believed he had um, based upon the fact that he went forward with the civil deposition and, uh, you know, put himself out there for those questions and did not um, did not raise any objection at that time or invoke his right to remain silent? Isn't that indicia of reliance on what he believed to be an agreement? Well, Your Honor, it, it is not. And uh, I'd also just point out that the trial court did not believe that it was indicia of reliance. And that's really the key issue here. Well, Your Honor, it, it is not. And uh, I'd also just point out that the trial court did not believe that it was indicia of reliance. And that's really the key issue here, whether the trial court. So defendant at, sat for the civil, civil depositions tried to give an exculpatory account and essentially did, although he slipped up and, ma and made statements that came back to haunt him. But he was trying to do exactly what he had done before. He was trying to avoid negative consequences of invoking the fifth in this situation, uh, and it backfired on him. That's what happened. There was no, uh, you know, and in one important point, and I think Justice Doherty uh, mentioned, mentioned it earlier, the defendant, by his own allegations, believed he had transactional immunity from Castor for Andrea Constant. That's it.